Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this digital version of A Conversation with William Nicholson, presented in conjunction with the Bloomsbury Festival 2020. My name's Ian Brown. I'm a friend of St George's Gardens in Bloomsbury. And it has been my very great pleasure to work with Sue Durrell and Jules Date to explore the life and work of one of the many people buried in the gardens, William Nicholson. Young scientists from nearby University College London's USAL team will help us and join us and show us how Nicholson's work not, was not only groundbreaking for its time, but is today providing us with solutions to solve our energy crisis in relation to global warming. If you know and love the gardens, then I don't need to tell you about the idyllic peace to be found here. If you don't know them, then be sure to explore them at the next opportunity you have. Now, perhaps more than ever, we value our green spaces in cities like never before. Please consider becoming a friend of St George's Gardens. You'll find us on Facebook. We run events throughout the year and advocate for the protection of the gardens, working closely with Camden Council and other organisations. A conversation with William Nicholson. Nicholson was such a polymath and his scientific publications have been well studied, but there are many other aspects of his life from international trade and the theatre, literature, feminism, a little bit of politics, and even a touch with treason. So I hope there's something for everybody here today, and hopefully the technical team will now play a pre-recorded video of my interview with Mr. Nicholson. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so, some years previously, Mr. Wedgwood had started a shop in Amsterdam, and it wasn't doing very well. Uh, the Dutch agents were pretty hopeless. They didn't understand about the importance of marketing. And they were cooking the books, and they were letting the Dutch potters copy the designs and uh, sell counterfeits. Now, in those days, Amsterdam was a, a big centre in trade. And as you said, the language of trade was French. So they sent me over there to try and sort things out. I mean, it was a huge responsibility. I was only 23 at the time. Goodness, yes, very young. But it sounds like you must have impressed Mr. Wedgwood. And I heard as well that he offered you the opportunity to take on the, the Dutch trade business. Yes, 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 he did. It's always been a, a matter of regret that I wasn't able to take him up on that. <laughs> Look, when I sailed for China, I earned 21 pounds and four shillings in 18 months. Mr. Wedgwood wanted 2,000 pounds for the stock in the Amsterdam shop. I was way, way beyond my means. Anyway, so I, I found him another agent for Holland and uh, yes, business was a great success. Well, it's still, Wedgwood is still a very important brand and a global mm -hmm. business today. But what happened to your job after that? <laughs> to work, of course. There wasn't much in the way of job security in those days. So I, I came back here and took what work I could. I, I, I did manage to get some hack work writing for the papers and periodicals. But there wasn't the end of your work with Mr Wedgwood, was it? No, no, Mr Wedgwood and I, we, we got on very well. We were both interested in, in, in science, so, so yes, we, we stayed in contact. He was a, a, a member of something called the Luna Society. <laughs> that was a, a group of uh, industrialists in the in the Midlands. They'd get together to talk about uh, uh, trade and science and innovations. Oh, that's a peculiar name, the Lunar Society. Why, why were they called that? <laughs> well, uh, we didn't have street lighting in those days. I think the first street in London to get gas lighting was in 1807. And this group used to meet in Birmingham, where in those days you ran the risk of highway men. So they would meet on the night of the full moon so that they could get home safely after their meetings. Oh. You know, in those days, these sort of societies, uh, philosophical societies and coffee clubs, they were, they were all the rage. Uh, Mr. Wedgwood and I were actually also members of, a, of another society that met near St. Paul's. So, yeah, yeah, so we, we, we kept in touch. I will accept that when I was uh, 
a younger man and and my publications uh, started to attract the attention of some important people. Yes, I, I was dazzled by the idea of membership of the, uh, the Royal Society. Uh, but then uh, some of my dear friends approached the president, Sir Joseph Banks, and learned that he would not support my application on the grounds of my background at sea and my work as a journalist. I mean, that's a bit of a blow. But you have to put these things behind you and carry on. And in fact, it was a good thing, because if I had been a member of the Royal Society, I would never have been able to launch my, my monthly magazine, because it would have been in direct competition with their philosophical transactions. What, what do you mean by those philosophical transactions? Oh, um, yes, that was their newsletter. It, it came out twice a year. And it, was a, it was a tediously slow affair. It did more to hold up knowledge, uh, the circulation of knowledge, than to help it. I mean, for example, if a scientific paper was read to the Royal Society in January, it wouldn't be published until their summer edition, months later. I mean, and then because it was very expensive, many people could only afford to, to read it if they were a member of a circulating library. So that, you know, that added further to the delay. I mean, I see you all sitting in the gardens with your, your information devices and getting information just by, by tapping and swiping. It looks absolutely fascinating, but can you imagine if you had to get that information from another scientific in, scientist in Europe by horseback, and then, then across the channel by, by boat, if the weather and the wars would allow you to, and then by, by horse again to London, and with all sorts of detours and delays, while the chap bringing the, the, the information went about his business. Oh, dear me, no. no, that does sound very frustrating. Um, and we have very little patience today. We've got used to having information at our fingertips, but it's not always accurate, though. So Well, yeah, I, I can see there is that, but... Um, but we needed to know what other scientists in this country were doing. Now, I'd had the, the chance to see some of the monthly magazines that were published in, in France and Germany. And I had the idea to start one here. I wanted to speed up the circulation of knowledge in this country. And, and you did in April 1797. Yeah, you launched your, it was called the Journal of Natural Philosophy, Chemistry and the Arts, and that was a monthly journal, so that must have been an awful lot of work while you were also running a school. <laughs> Goodness me, yes, well, they, well, for the first edition, I had to write most of the articles myself. Um, but uh, pretty soon, lots of people were sending articles in, and they were they were proposing um, problems that needed solutions. And it was, it was all very democratic because I, I chose the articles on the basis of how interesting and, and useful they were to my, my my readers, rather than on the basis of the importance of the the author. And I mean, we covered absolutely everything from botany, from hat making, from hydraulic engineering to electricity, anything that was going to be useful and interesting to my readers. Um, what about Humphrey Davy? Now, he's, um, he's someone who wrote you quite a bit as well, didn't he? Oh, uh, yes, Humphrey Davy. Now, yes, he was quite a character. Um, yeah, yes, you're right, he used his only quite a lot of articles when he was uh, starting out in Bristol. He actually became quite notorious for his, uh, his experiments with nitrous oxide, um, laughing gas, as he called it. And later on, he, he invented the mi uh, minor safety lamp, but that, that was a lot later when I'd, I'd make myself comfortable here in the gardens. And um, yes, when he came up to London to, to work at the Royal Institution in, in Mayfair, he, he'd often come around to dinner with us. And uh, he, became, he became famous for, for his lectures. You know, the fashionable crowd would go and see Humphrey Davies experiments as an alternative to the theater. You mean, you mean people went to see scientific experiments as entertainment? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and you had to, you had to dress up. Um, <laughs> as well as being a very good scientist. Um, Humphrey Davy was also a rather dashing and handsome young man. And my wife and all my daughters and little Mary Godwin, they would all demand new dresses to go and see Humphrey Davy give his lectures at the Royal Institution on chemistry or electricity. They never twitted around and made a fuss like that when I gave my lectures. 
<laughs> you did. But you did cause quite a bit of excitement in the scientific world. I think you're being very modest again. It was in 1800, you made a very important scientific discovery. And the discovery about which Sir Humphrey Davy said it had the potential to acquaint us with some of the laws of life. Mm. Yes, 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 he did say that. It was, it was some years later. Uh, it was to the Royal Society. <laughs> I, was, I was in the front room at uh, the house on, on Soho Square, and I, I was messing around with um, a, a pile of discs following the, the design of the battery pile by Mr. Volta. My son had uh, uh, brought in a washing up bowl of water and uh, my, my good friend, Dr. Anthony Carlyle was there. He'd been visiting one of my daughters. <laughs> I can remember it clear as day. I, I was experimenting by attaching the, the wires from the battery to different substances to see what the, the reaction would be. And when we put the wires in the water, we saw two different gases being created and, and we were able to capture these gases and, and one of those gases was oxygen and one of them was hydrogen. We had succeeded in, in, in separating water into its, its separate constituents uh, and, and, and uh, by using the electricity from, from the battery and proving that water was not a, a single element as, as so many people describe. It's actually quite difficult to explain without having the, the, the equipment here. Well, well, as it happens, on my information gadget, I was able to recruit some scientists from the nearby University College London, and they actually specialise in electrochemistry, which is science which uses your, your discovery of splitting water. And they volunteered to come to the garden today to re recreate your experiment for everybody. Oh. Oh. And, and they're going to also provide an opportunity to talk about what that discovery led to and where it's going to in the future. Well, it would, be, it would be absolutely lovely to see the experiment again. And yes, I would be delighted to meet some, some fellow scientists. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap up here in our virtual um, conversation in the gardens and move on to um, another part of the gardens where we're going to look at a scientific demonstration by by the students. So thank I will you. see you there. See you there.